Amen. Great, great blessing and privilege. I want to thank Pastor Greg for the privilege of standing behind this pulpit and every man who stands here feels the weight of it. And I would say that one thing that we have learned over the past year as a fellowship is that Pastor Greg is Pastor Mitchell with fresh legs. And we can do this. Amen. Now, like Jonathan Heimberg, I had this sermon. It was locked and loaded. It was in the pre-conference protocol. I preached it on Sunday morning. I had them take it down off of live stream. I was sitting here all week, listening to each preacher give his text, breathing a sigh of relief. And then last night, God started talking to me. And I said, no. And God said, yes. So I'm preaching this out of Matthew 7 this morning, chapter 7, verse 21. The Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. And so I am the third witness. This fellowship was birthed out of the Jesus people movement. We know that. It was a very powerful revival that broke out among, in the midst of a particular generation, a generation of people known as the baby boomers. The baby boomers were those born immediately after the Second World War. It was a huge generation of babies that were born, and they affected history as they matured. And in the late 60s and 70s, they began to get saved in this movement we call the Jesus people movement and our fellowship was birthed out of that very powerful movement and so our, they were young people most of them were single unchurched and bible illiterate and I understand that in Prescott because it was a four square church they were invited to a lot of uh, four square activities that involved youth that a lot of the young disciples here ran into church kids from Foursquare, and there was some conflict from some of the stories I'd heard. But in Tucson, where I was saved, Pastor Warner's church, we didn't see a lot of church kids. We didn't know any. There weren't any church kids in our church. We were all kids between 15 and 25, most of us, uh, but none of us had been raised in church. It's certainly not that church. We were all new converts. We were single. We were unchurched for the most part and Bible illiterate. Church kids were an unknown commodity. I remember hearing sermons about Hophni and Phineas and how they were sitting in the house of God, and I, I couldn't understand why a teenager would go to church to party. It just didn't make sense to me. I couldn't relate to that. Just leave, go party. Why do that? But you know, time has passed. And these young people who got saved then have become parents, and now many of us are grandparents, even some are great-grandparents. And so that now, 50 years later, church kids are the most common and the most influential people in our fellowship, and they should be. The leader of our fellowship is a church kid. Most of the disciples in our churches, most of the pioneers who are going to stand up here are church kids who got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and are standing on the spiritual shoulders of parents and grandparents. But there is a generation of unsaved or backslidden church kids that make up a unique, albeit small, group in the sea of humanity. These are church kids who know God's ways but don't know God, who know more about the Bible than the first generation of pioneer pastors, but they don't live it. And it seems that Jesus anticipated this generation when he spoke these words that we're going to read. A unique group of people who have grown up, who know the house of God, but don't know him personally. People who have a second-hand Jesus. 
And I'm preaching secondhand Jesus living as an unsaved church kid. Matthew 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears uh, these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for the spirit of power to complete the work that you have begun in hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Secondhand, Jesus. My first point is simply this. We have a generation of people who have grown up who are able to say the potter's house is my family religion. It's part of your background. What's a person's background? A person's background are those things about you that you did not choose. You did not choose your parents, you didn't choose your relatives, you didn't choose your hometown, and if you're a church kid, you probably didn't even choose your friends, because even your friends ended up being the kids of the friends of your parents. You know, they've known them like forever, dude, since, you know, the 70s or, or the 80s and the 90s. And to you, I should say to many, God is like a distant relative. You see him on the holidays, but you don't really know him personally. Well, as has been pointed out, God has no grandchildren. He can't be your Lord and Savior once removed. But when you are a church kid, you're raised in church from the time you're an infant, it's easy to have an assumption by association. In the text, Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And they're going to say, didn't we? Not didn't I. Didn't we? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do many wonders in your name? In other words, I was there. I was sitting on the front row. I was even stretching out my hand. Didn't we? And Jesus is going to answer these people, and he's going to say, I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness, or as we've heard, you who do your own thing. You see, I'm talking about a very unique experience. I'm talking about a person who has grown up around Christians, grown up around the house of God as their chief life experience. That's a very unique group of people. Are you saved? If you're a church kid, that's not the first time you heard that question. If you're a church kid, you've been praying sinner's prayer since you were in nursery. And then children's church. And every step along the way, are you saved? Raise your hand. You prayed a sinner's prayer a hundred times. 50 times on your own, just to be sure. <laughs> you are familiar with the ways and the moving of the Holy Spirit. You understand prophecy. You understand getting, how to get dominion over demons. You've seen mir so many miracles, you can't count them. And what makes a church kid so radically different than any other kind of sinner is that they are personally familiar with the moving of the Spirit of God. You're raised in an environment that has made you a good person. People like you. You have a work ethic. You're honest, or at least you know you should be. You have people skills because your mother taught you to say please and thank you. You can at least 
act like you're humble. <laughs> because you know the benefit of it. You're a church kid. But the issue is, like Jesus said, I never knew you. See, a church kid is somebody who has been spared an awful lot of things in this world because you've been covered and there's people, real Christians, who've been praying for you since you were an infant. But having spiritual knowledge and having spiritual dominion are two different things. The interesting story that was already talked about out of Acts 19 in a place called Ephesus where you had some church kids of that day who were trying to exercise spiritual power without having spiritual dominion. It said that some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. These were young men raised in the synagogue. They were the church kids of their day. They grew up learning everything about the Bible. They knew all the stories. They knew about Adam and Eve. They knew about uh, Noah and his ark. They knew about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Daniel, and especially David and Goliath. They were little boys who stood there with their swords. And they said, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. And then they would boom, kill Goliath and chop his head off. That's how they grew up. They knew more about God and the devil, more about right and wrong, heaven and hell, than 99% of the population. They were church kids, and yet they had no dominion whatsoever. They could see that these people were demon-possessed. They could see that they had very serious problems, and they even knew the answer. Church kids know when people are demon-possessed. They see them, and they say, that person's got a devil. And they think that everybody else in the world sees it too, but they don't. The people of the world say they have issues. He hasn't taken his meds today. But the church kid's like, no, he's got a demon. And they even know the answer. Church kids see the effects of sin. They see the effects of addiction. They see the effects of perversion all around them. They know it's wrong. They know it's destructive. And they even know the answer. It's possible to have spiritual awareness, but have no spiritual power. To have spiritual insight and be totally clueless at the same time. We have a generation of people who have grown up, some of them, who have not gotten saved or backslid, and they go to parties and party and witness to other sinners. No, man, it's called the rapture, dude. Yeah, it's in the Bible. Antichrist, man. Yep, it's all true. I saw this movie. There are three of them. Yeah, man, they cut your head off. Let me just stop for a minute and speak to someone who may be listening, whether they're here or watching on live stream somewhere, 
If you are not a Christian and you are dating a church kid, I'm going to pull the cover. That church kid that you're dating knows that you're going to hell. They know. And they obviously don't care. They're going to date you, have fun, and in the back of their minds, they're saying, later I'll get saved, but you'll go to hell. Oh, well. An unsaved church kid is no match for the devil. Spiritual authority and spiritual dominion don't come from knowledge, doesn't come from a formula, it comes through relationship with Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when it comes down to it, in the end, an unsaved church kid is just another sinner. In the end, if you don't get born again, you will have had no real advantage for having been raised in a Christian home. For having been raised in the house of God, except that maybe it gets you a better job because you actually went to class. But that'd be about it. In the end, there's no benefit in being a good law-abiding sinner. Good law-abiding sinners go to the same hell as the other kind. You must be born again. You're one of the seven sons of Siva. The devil is having his way with you. Let me talk to you about the end of the road for the unsaved church kid. Matthew 24. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is. Man, it would be great if it happened right there, right? The end of the road for the unsaved church kid, your worst fears have come upon you. You've been left behind. After all the dreams, after all those little scares, when you didn't know where your mom was, All those phone calls, hello, click. <laughs> oh, I butt dialed, man. I just, you know, didn't mean to. Jesus is saying, when that moment happens, there are going to be people in close association. Two men doing the same thing, two women doing the same thing, but one's gone and the other's not gone. One is left behind. These are people who know each other. These are people who are in close proximity on a regular basis. But one is gone and the other is not gone. You've known about this your whole life. You can quote the prophecies. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I'm not that dumb. I'll just get saved. Okay, well, even if the rapture happens, dude, I'll just get saved. Probably not. So how can you say that? Because of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Listen. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. 
with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That is post-rapture. This is God sending a strong delusion on a certain group of people. Well, it didn't, that doesn't necessarily mean church kid, Pastor Ray. I mean, it just says those who did not receive the love of the truth. Isn't that all sinners? Yes. But we do know that some sinners are going to get saved during the tribulation, right? So it can't mean all sinners. So then who could it mean? It's talking about the backslider. In other words, God is sending powerful conviction now so that you will believe the truth. But if you reject the truth long enough, there will come a day when in judgment he will send a strong delusion that you would believe the lie. So if you think you're just going to wait it out and if the rapture happens you'll just get saved, you probably won't. You spent your entire life resisting God's conviction. You spent your entire life not listening to God's voice when all you had to do was make a decision to give up your sin. But when the rapture comes, the conviction you're feeling right now, you won't feel anymore. Because in its place, the Bible says there will be a strong delusion, which is the opposite of conviction. You see, there's no such thing as a secondhand Jesus. You need a personal Savior. Or not at all. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Jesus said that to who? He said that those words to those who said to him, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord, didn't we? I was there. I was there personally. I saw it all happen. And he says, yes, I know, but I didn't know you. You who practice lawlessness. Yeah, I know you were there. I saw you in Sunday school. I saw you when you gave all the right answers. I saw you when you were involved in the parade float, and I saw you were involved in this ministry and that ministry. But I never knew you. Because you practiced lawlessness, meaning you wanted this life to be for you. You wanted to do what you wanted to do. One thing that is a little bit ironic is that sometimes the same parents who pray their hearts out for their children so that they would be saved can sometimes unwittingly encourage their children in the wrong direction. If, for example, you're a pioneer and your children are used to hearing you and your wife talk about how hard it is, all the difficulties, 
If you're always lamenting about what you're doing without or what you could have been doing had you not answered the call of God, you're nudging them toward trying to secure their futures. You're nudging them toward, I better look out for myself because if I don't, who will? Yeah, I know you were there. I know you were at that conference. I saw you when you answered that altar call. But I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. You who have purpose to do your own will. Like I said, I'm the third witness. Pastor Richard on Wednesday, Pastor Paul yesterday, and God dealt with me, and I'm the third witness. Listen to me, church kid. This fellowship is about you. Back in the early days when uh, all these young people were getting saved in the, uh, in the 70s and the 80s, and we were flooding into the, our churches, we expected the rapture to come any day. I bought a 1974 Honda Civic, and I said, I'm going to drive this thing till Jesus comes back. <laughs> that was a long time ago. We thought his coming was imminent. And we thought, surely, the rapture was going to come. And we would be gone. We'd see that glorious day. But you know, Glenn Cluck, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. And that's all of us, right? Pastor Mitchell, Ron Bannett, Others, that generation of baby boomers, we were so sure we are going to hear that trumpet sound. And we may still, today. But it's also possible that we may be among those who are risen from the dead before you who are raptured. That means that this fellowship is about the church kids. You say, well, can't God use sinners that got, will get saved? Absolutely. That's who built the fellowship. But do you think it's a coincidence that God has risen up a generation of people that have been sheltered in the house of God from the time they have been born? You think it's a coincidence that you've been raised in the things of God with your head screwed on right concerning right and wrong? And up and down, you've been spared the curses, you've been sheltered and covered and protected. You think that's just a coincidence? Or do you think that maybe God is raising up that generation for his hour and his time? He's raising up the church kid to be baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost and power to prophesy, to go to the nations of the world with a sense of fearlessness because your spirit's clean, your soul is clean because you've been spared the garbage of the world. You know, people backslide in church kids and they say, well, you know, he's working on his testimony. Ha, 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 ha. Friend, that's sad. That is pathetic. In my opinion, what that really is saying is I don't respect what my parents did for me. I don't respect their prayers and their efforts to shelter me and cover me and protect me. I'm casting that aside to jump into the pigsty so that one day I can come back with a tattoo of a pig on me and say, yeah, man, I was in the pigsty, but Jesus set me free. I think a far better testimony is, you know what? I was raised in the house of God. I got saved. I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And I've been serving God all my life. And I'm going to live for God. I'm going to shake this world for Jesus Christ. That's a far better testimony.
Acts chapter 2. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. You know what God has done in 50 years? All these young men are now old men who have dreams of what God can do, and because of their dreams, the young men are having visions of what God can do, and they're walking in those visions, and they're living out these visions. What we experience, what we feel in this conference, the cutting edge, the fearlessness that we feel regarding the future was purchased by those who have come before, by those upon whose shoulders you stand. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Miracles, miracles, miracles. These people who are answering Jesus, didn't we? What are they talking about? The supernatural. In other words, even though they weren't saved, the supernatural was common. They were familiar with the supernatural. Miracles, miracles, miracles. And that means this, church kid, the rapture is going to be your moment. The rapture is the flip side of the first resurrection. The first resurrection is not about the rapture primarily. The first resurrection is about the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus said there will be two resurrections in John 5. The resurrection of the just, the resurrection of the unjust. The first resurrection will be the resurrection of those who are born again, the bride of Christ. But there's going to be a generation of Christians who will not have died when that happens. And those people are the ones who will be raptured. And like I say, you, my peers, we thought for sure it was any day. And it still may be. But I think now a lot of us are looking in the mirror and saying, I may be in the first group. <laughs> so be it. But what does that say about you? That means... That that moment, the rapture, is going to be your moment. But that moment will have been preceded by a worldwide shaking, a worldwide revival. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations to all people as a witness. And then the end will come. That is a prophecy about somebody who's going to reach the world. A generation of people who have been prepared from the time they were infants, fashioned like arrows, straight to fly straight and true to the target. You're unique. Out of eight billion people on this planet, very, very, very few people have your experience to be raised in the house of God to be raised with godly parents, to be raised with an understanding that Jesus Christ is Lord and that Jesus Christ wants the gospel to be preached to every nation of the world. You've been raised with that. You know that some of you, a lot of you, perhaps most of you, have been giving to world evangelism from the time you were too young to understand what that means. You gave in children's church, and then maybe where you have Bible conference, they would bring up a big check. You ever seen that? This is what our children's church or our, what we did. And, you, and the kids are staying there, and they're very happy, and they're very proud. God sees all that. All that matters. A lot of that is directly responsible for what we saw last night. And we're just getting started. But I'm telling you, It's about the church kid. This fellowship, God has done all he's done these last 50 years to lay a foundation for a generation that are going to see a move of God that this world has never seen. And I'm telling you, you came up on Wednesday night. You came up yesterday. I'm the third witness. It takes three nails for a crucifixion. 
Pastor Lamb's going to pull an altar call after preaching the Word of God powerfully, no doubt. And I would strongly urge you to come again to this altar and apply the third nail and say, you know what, I'm going to be crucified with Christ. It's not me who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. Amen. I'm done. Pastor Morales, would you come?